we start tonight, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered this evening on unceded cedar close to Salish territory. As most of you know, my name is John Bishop and I am the Chair of Positive Living with C. Welcome to be your host for a little while longer. I need to uh, make special mention and thanks to our pharmaceutical sponsors for this evening who provided us with the meal and the means to uh, get this room booked. That would be AbV, Bristol Myers Squibb, Gilead, Janssen, Merck, and V. They all make our community forums possible. Thank you for to our pharmaceutical sponsors. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. The uh, bathrooms are located out the doors to your left. Um, also, please put your phones on vibrate or turn them off as a courtesy to uh, Dr. Burgess. And this evening, uh, we have made an initiative over the last little while to reach our, to achieve our provincial mandate. And so we will be uh, broadcasting this through a webinar facility. Um, if you know people who live outside of the Vancouver region or who even live within the Vancouver region and aren't comfortable being here or it's difficult for them to be here, let them know that all of our community forums are available online in an online forum so that people can attend virtually and, and that I think it's important that uh, you can help us get that message out to people. That would be greatly appreciated. So uh, to those who are online, welcome. Uh, we also record this event, so there will be a camera recording the speaker only. Um, so none of you will be on the camera unless you want to come up and do a dog pony or something. Yes, something like that, I suppose, but, um, and if we have time for questions at the end of the presentation, uh, that uh, we would ask you to, be, to hold your questions until that point. If there is anybody who doesn't want to voice the question for uh, whatever reason, where is Shelley? Shelley, where are you? There she is, way at the back of the room. Go and, go and grab Shelley, she'll take your question from you and bring it up to the front of the room to be asked. And uh, online, if you can just uh, let our moderator know that you have something to be asked, and we'll, we'll get that uh, dealt with. So, little, finally, after all my rowel, <laughs> Dr. Sue Burgess. While reading over Dr. Burgess's curriculum, it uh, covers 40 years of education and experience, to be honest with you, after working for 35, I don't know how she still does it, but anyway. One is immediately struck by the depth of her compassionate care and the extraordinary service she brings to the HIV community. She still does house calls. Pretty, pretty amazing in this day and age. Her expertise in palliative care, obstetrics, preventative medicine, childhood sexual abuse, HIV, HIV HCV. Sorry, is that that is that hepatitis C? That, okay, thank you. Um, women's health, inner city health care, and addiction medicine are truly remarkable. Her rewards and her appointments are many. Her links to community more than I can count on two hands of her teaching as a clinical associate professor at UBC all amount to one very important individual. We are lucky to have her in our community and to have her with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sue. So, um, when I was asked by Shelley to sort of think about this topic, um, it struck me that, you know, there's been an awful lot of talk about um, the history of HIV this year, uh, and about the history of HIV locally. So I even got asked to do a round about um, the downtown east side epidemic in the 90s, and, uh, and I kind of, I, I, I studied history and I thought, I'm not old now. Yeah, I am old. Um, and why am I still here? You know? um, and I thought, well, it's because I haven't got it right yet. That's why. But, um, but many of the people I met in the 90s, and I was privileged to meet, um, are still there too. And, and so are many more who represent more recently infected folks, but often from different um, demographics. And some of you may have been in Melbourne and, um, or read a lot of discussion in the press um, and academic papers about HIV cures. So this is the history of HIV, the end of AIDS, all that sort of stuff. Um, but we know that while there's lots of new science and understanding, people are still living with HIV and acquiring HIV. And cure per se is 
not um, going to be happening anytime soon. And the other thing that's a passion of mine, and let's be clear, uh, that while Canada and BC, and we really do have all the bells and whistles uh, and resources, um, this is not the case for the majority of the world. So there, you know, BC, the center likes to brag about how we've kind of defeated HIV, but um, donors are pulling back and they're using this sense that things are getting better as reasons to hand more responsibility to poor countries and governments who really um, don't have the resources uh, that we have. And our brothers and sisters in the rest of the world are not seeing the United States. And those are huge numbers. And in our own community, as you guys, as positive living know so well, there is a wide spectrum of experience in living with HIV that depends on which decade the virus was transmitted and when a person started ART. And maybe what we could do a little bit uh, together is examine some of the data now around life expectancy within the various decades. And so that positive living at your AGM can confirm that your activities match what's happening with HIV here in 2014. So um, let's do that by looking at some of the, it's NAA cord um, numbers uh, to maybe better inform ourselves in our conversation. And this report, this is a report that came out in 2013 in December, looking at um, various cohort co courts in the States and here in BC and in Canada between 2000 and 2007. Um, they, did, they chose that era, um, those, in, those years, as an example of, kind of the modern era and agreed. I think, well, we have lots of new things since 2007. Actually, things really did start to kind of change in that time. So NAA Corps, and I have to read this, um, stands for the North American Cohort Collaboration on Research and Design. And so what they did was they calculated mortality rates from ART start to death or loss to follow-up, and express that as a number of years someone who's 20 years old on treatment could be expected to live if everything else stayed the same. So is that kind of clear? So um, how long I'm going to live now kind of depends on a bunch of factors, life expectancy factors. Um, and so they've calculated that for these folks throughout North America um, in that time period, and it's really interesting. <clears throat> so, let's see, if you, this, this is a summary of basically the people involved in the cohorts, and probably a lot of us were involved <coughs> in these numbers, to be quite frank, because it included BC. And if you look, they're divided into three periods, 2000 to 2002, 2003 to 2005, 2006 to 2007. So that's actually quite a short period, but it's divided into three. And there are four age groups. And I'll cut to the results, which I think are wonderful. The results showed that life expectancy in this short window, but representing the modern era, rose from 36.1 years in 2000 to over 51.4 years by 2007. So if I were 20, I could live into my 70s in the modern era on ART. And this number is just about the same for people who are not living with HIV. And we'll look again at this short, but let's first remember the earlier decades. So I think some of us here know these decades pretty intimately. And from that time to now, newer challenges have grown. But no one with this profound experience in the 1980s, and I think 
you know, elsewhere in our city in the 90s um, can forget. And I think at this moment in the discussion of the history of HIV, and the end of HIV, um, we must not let them be forgotten in turn. In many ways, though, given that you know, things are better, um, this focus on survival is still how we think of each other, the search for survival. <coughs> but as the numbers in A Court showed, reality, with so many new and improved treatment options, there have been huge health gains. And actually, I can sincerely, I mean really sincerely, tell people newly infected now that this, that this is actually a better diagnosis than if I were to tell them that they had diabetes or cancer, medically speaking. And although we see signs thank you, that those with HIV may appear to age more rapidly, the data actually shows that this may not just be HIV related, but actually subject to improvement with lifestyle. <clears throat> so look at this slide, and if you look at kind of the second last column, it's looking at death rates. And if you look at that closely, looking at the, the different um, Sorry. Well, I'm trying to look at. Um, so, the second the second um, column basically shows who's benefiting and who's not. So, what you can see here at the top is overall, then differentiating male and female, then mode of transmission, injection, drug use, MSN, and other, and then race. And I think this is pretty profound, um, white and non-white. Um, look at the differences in death rates there. And then people who start late, CD4 count at start. So big difference for some groups there. Things are getting better. Things are getting better for everyone, but not at the same rate. <clears throat> so this slide shows how mortality rates improve in the different time period. Okay, so we see that the mortality rate increases dramatically, particularly in the early period, for older people with, living with HIV, but that's just at the end of your life, quick, you know, expect. Um, but everything's slowing down in terms of how fast people die. Now, this is a bit complicated. I like this one here, because this one shows how things, just in seven years, got so much better. But then you look at, again, those four groups, men and women, how people receive the, their infection, race, white and non-white, and then at what CD4 count you started. And while just what everything is improving, um, it's not improving as robustly for women, for IDUs, for non-white particularly, and people who start late. Okay. So, again, this is something similar, looking in, in those, um, those different um, time frames, we see an overall improvement. But again, some people aren't living as long as others. So um, if, I were, if I were in this slide, I want to be a, a male MSN who was white and started when my CD4 was like 400. And I'd be laughing. So looking at the differences, the conclusion is that the gap in life expectancy may be attributable, it's I think really important to say, to other factors. Okay. Not just HIV. There's a lot of talk about HIV accelerating aging and all 
all that sort of stuff. Looking at this, on treatment, that doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, probably the differences in life expectancy and overall health is related more to lifestyle. I hate to say this because it's true though. Um, genetics and economics and not just HIV. So, it's clear that a non-white woman who may be using injection drugs that starts ART late, which in fact is a lot of folks I get to meet, um, those people will have a shorter life even though they're taking the same ART for the same length of time. So this is a bit confusing, but kind of bear with me by sort of immersing yourself in these three definitions. This is when people talk about aging and so forth. Well, what, what do we mean by that? Um, what I think there is when we say there's accelerated aging in HIV, and I have loads of sort of publications about that. What, what I think that means is that there's more awareness about the comorbidities of aging, now seen in those who have survived long enough to experience them. So if you survive long enough, you'll get heart disease. You certainly increase your heart disease risk in North America. And you'll, your bones will thin out. You'll maybe be more at risk of diabetes and osteoarthritis. And these illnesses now in our populations are more common than PCP. Right? But they're also common within the general North American population. And also globally. When I go to Africa, I am totally blown away that often the most common diagnosis in their outpatient um, clinics is diabetes. So, is it clear what those sort of three, um, when you're talking about old people, the differences between those definitions are? So, there are people who survived, a long time before there was treatment available to them, and now they're older, and good on for them. And then there are older people who are getting newly infected, and so they bring their own comorbidities. And then there are those who have been on effective treatment for a long time who happen to be aging. So, until we kind of understand the differences between those groups, and those definitions, I think to say that having HIV means you're going to get demented um, is incorrect. So, this is my favorite grandmother. Oh, sorry, did you want to ask a question? Sorry. Just wanted to know if we're at the point that we have an estimate, um, not a guarantee, but just even an estimate that it's apparent through common trends between uh, people in the same cohorts and the same situations or similar situations uh, as far as uh, expectancy comes. In terms of life expectancy or health outcomes? Uh, sort of both. Okay. Um, if there's like conclusive proof that's already been explored or if it's... Well, I think it's a really good question. I think your question is, do we kind of know um, how people will do, um, relatively speaking? Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of going to try and answer that. Um, I think what something like ACORD is showing is that um, people who look after themselves are going to do better. People who can't or don't, don't do better. And that applies to everybody. Okay? So there is not some, and this is, there is not something particular about HIV that means you're doomed, okay, in that sort of sense. I mean, obviously, you need to be on treatment, but you need to do all this other stuff, just like everyone else does too. So I don't, I think that's what just we're seeing. Curious if there are already established trends or not. Yeah. That's now, awesome. but you have to remember that there are people who have been very ill for many years before there was treatment. 
and so lots of things have happened to those bodies, but at the same time you can see a wonderful renaissance amongst the individuals as well, who then start to start to look after themselves because they're not going to die all of a sudden. Whoa, I'm not dying. Actually, I might go to the gym now. You know, that's actually really hard, but that's that's what we're seeing, which I think is fabulous. But it doesn't. But it also means that there'll be more and more people who happen to have HIV who are getting old, right? With all of those health issues that older people have in their health. So, hope that moves on. Okay. So I'm I'm just looking at those various um, uh, four groups. Um, I thought I'd just give a little example. This is, as I was saying, my favorite grandmother. And um, so some of the vulnerabilities, she examples, exemplifies for me some of the vulnerabilities that the in-court study brought up. She's obviously non-white. She was poor. The story is poor. And through no fault of her own, she was allowed to remain unsuppressed um, for many years, even though on treatment. And so she's an elder and living with heart disease, Parkinson's, and she's had a stroke. Okay. But she's doing beautifully with the HIV, just beautifully. Okay. But to me, she looks like a like hundred other non-HIV positive grandmothers. And that's how she's living, because she's looking after herself. Now, Janet, also non-white, but female and a drug user, has just developed diabetes. Um, but so did both her parents who were non-HIV. Um, and in addition, she has not looked after her general health, except for her HIV, which is great. So this is a person who, for whom getting diabetes is kind of predictable, but because they haven't looked after themselves, might be a more serious um, situation for them. So, just sort of in conclusion, my reading of the data and what I see among my patients, HIV and non-HIV infected, is that, and I hate this because it applies to everybody, exercise, <laughs> stimulating activity, healthy food and trusting relationships, as well as self-efficacy is able to make a huge difference in how people age. I know it sounds trite, but the data is really solid. It's really solid. Uh, I mean, doctors are starting to write exercise prescriptions and it's long overdue. You know, doctors doing exercise is long overdue. <laughs> so I, my challenge to positive living, uh, and this is where actually as an organization I think you stand really tall, is by actively supporting self-care with so many programs. And so many programs that extend to those groups that aren't doing very well, that have trouble doing very well. Um, when you have nutrition programs, when you have um, uh, programs that look at emotional health, when you have programs that educate people about the reality of HIV, not the shame of HIV, and the despair of HIV, but living well with HIV, making a huge difference in people's health. And as an organization, what I see is that you actually reach out to those non-white, um, IVU or drug-using poor people who have great, great need of all of these kind of difficult things. I mean, one, look at those two, um, two columns. You know, both, both, to move from one to the other is a huge challenge for all of us. You know, I don't know how many of you smoke here. Um, I'm hoping by tomorrow fewer of you will. Um, but right now, the way HIV itself is, is that if you look after uh, yourself, you're 
family doctor, and your gym are your best friends now with the medications. Um, it's not an exotic thing. It's not a, a, a real specialized thing. If I were to be diagnosed today, but if I don't look after myself, it will um, come back to haunt me. So let's talk about whatever, but a sense of what is it what is it that people have lived over all of those decades? And what in 2014 can positive living um, express to all of those decades um, and to people who shortly, unfortunately, will acquire HIV because it's still being acquired? Um, you know, it was mentioned when I first came in that there's big changes on 10C. Um, there, my sense when um, um, I was asked to come speak with you was this whole emphasis on the history of the was kind of premature, that we were kind of moving on. Um, so what does moving on look like in 2014? Uh, you guys are the experts. Well, I just want to sort of chime in, I guess, on what you had just said. Um, I have just completed the Healthy Heart Program at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, not because I've had a heart attack, but because I started to put on way, way too much weight for myself. Um, I've lost 20 pounds since March, which is really makes me feel really good. I've got 30 more to go, <laughs> but we're on the right track. Um, and in that program, there was a Dr. Mike who uh, has a video on YouTube, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but he, he gets down to the bottom line and physicians need to start prescribing exercise for more than just long life, for depression, for a whole bunch of the, for diabetes. Exercise, getting out and walking vigorously for half an hour, five days a week, is the best thing you can do for yourself in all of your health. Okay. Thanks, Sue, so much. I'm going to try and hop around like a bunny and dancer and uh, bring the mic back and forth. But actually, if you can, if you're brave and want to come to the front, that'd be perfect. And I'll point. I thank you for all the information. I think it was a great, uh, great presentation. I think with Positive Living, we've done a lot of steps to make people more aware of how to be healthier. But I think one issue that needs to be addressed, not only provincially but nationally, is the health about sexuality period. It's um, our children still aren't being educated in terms of sex education in the proper way. This is why we're seeing HIV increase. Uh, people are still being taught they cannot be proud of the bodies, they cannot express themselves properly. This needs to change. When we change that, we change the attitudes about health, we change the attitudes about self-esteem, and we change the attitudes about how we create community and how we get along. That's excellent. Thank you. You know, I, I, I have um, a couple of daughters who are older now, but um, I noticed a, a real change in that exact discussion within the public education system. So there was a lot of discussion at one point, and that kind of petered out. You know? And people really are not as aware as you suggested as I think they could be. Right? That's not point. Question? Is there a certain life expectancy for people who are co-infected with the hep C and HIV? Great question. You should be able to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Hep C is, um, is an evolving story, right? Um, many of the people I know are co-infected, um, and we know that being co-infected makes both of them kind of more powerful. Um, having said that, um, Hep C is now something, or soon will be something that will be as happily treatable or as HIV easily, without a horrendous um, a bunch of meds and injections and so forth. And what we what we're seeing is that now treating Hep C um, 
in HIV positive people is wildly successful, whereas a couple of years ago it wasn't. The results were terrible. So I'm still looking after people who are um, not doing well because they haven't had that opportunity. In the next few years, I think that will change and um, we'll have great treatments that will make a, a huge difference and get rid of hep C. You can actually eradicate it um, fairly easily. So we're going to see some great things. We're just on the cusp right now. Okay. You know, good treatment is available. It's not paid for and all of that yet. But in a few years, it's going to be paid for because it will make a huge difference um, to everybody's life. Without treatment, though, Remaining co-infected without treatment, I mean, it's a good question we need to know that that's not kind of a good situation. You kind of want to you get your HIV, great. The hep C is still there. We would advise if people can that when the appropriate time comes, we get rid of them too. Thank you, Doc. Kanachi? <coughs> Thanks. Dr. Burgess. Um, my name is Manakshi and I'm lucky enough to work at Positive Living and your presentation, it really made me feel good about the work we do because when I looked at the left side of the column and saw who's really impacted by HIV today, it's, you know, people who are disadvantaged in a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, it made me feel really good about the prison outreach program. And I'm going to toot my own horn and Ben's horn yeah. and Positive Living's horn because I think it's fantastic. And there are you know, people behind bars who obviously can't be here with us today um, who are living with HIV. And it is largely people who are not white, who are poor, who have histories of addiction, um, who come out and don't benefit from HIV care in the same way because they've never been given like, the capacity and the tools to have health advocacy and to have positive engagements with the healthcare system. So, thank you. I, I mean, it also inspires me to work much harder. Um, but, and it's, I think, a powerful reminder of, you know, although there are important changes and we're really fortunate to live in BC, there are also people who are like lagging behind because of the systems of care we have don't benefit them in the same way. So, thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Everybody. Thank you. Meds that they're using. I'm thinking, well, I know other people on these same meds, and they're doing great. 
like their CD4 count is high and their viral load is undetectable. So why isn't it working for this guy? Is it, is it something about his genetics, like it's just bad luck? Or is it about being diagnosed late and the virus has had a long time to work in the body? That's my question about what's going on with people who are diagnosed late and the meds don't seem to be working. Yes. All right. So um, the thing about HIV is all the meds work. You take your meds, they work. Almost 100 percent. So they're not working because people are either having difficulty taking them, um, or have a mental illness around it. Um, sort of take them. I had a schizophrenic guy come up to me today and say, "I don't want to take the same number of Kaletra today." I said, "Well, no, we have to." Well. No, I think I'll just take one. No. So, I mean, but if you if, if, uh, So, they all work. I mean, that's the amazing thing. It's not like they sort of work anymore. We've had years of sort of working, or working a little bit. They work, you take your medicines. That's all. You have to take them every day, ideally. Some of them, there's a bit of wiggle room, but they work. Those folks, if they're starting late, doesn't mean just taking the pills means that they're not vulnerable to AIDS, what we call, used to call AIDS-defined illnesses. Things that you're not protected against because your immune system is so low. Their immune system is low. What the meds do is bring down the amount of virus in your blood, hopefully to undetectable, which is our goal, so that your own immune system in late um, folk diagnosis often very low, can start to rebuild. You're still vulnerable to those infections. But the meds work because what they do is decrease the virus. So it just takes time for the immune system to rebuild. That's right. And and sometimes, to be frank, that's why we don't want anybody under 350 and not 500 um, not to know their status. Not people starting. If your immune system is really low, and again, Lots of people like that, um, their CD4s are 50, they may not get up very high. I mean, I rejoice if somebody's 95 or 100. So they're still vulnerable with a low immune system to all of those other things that they can't protect themselves against. But at the least, they're not going to have the virus. Well, no. No, let's, let's, let's talk about this sort of conversation we were just having, what can you and I do to actually improve our own immune systems? There's, there, we can do so much. We can do all of those things that we're on that rough call. It does make a huge difference. Good nutrition, exercise, not using drugs, not smoking, right? Being kind of, of dealing with whatever trauma or mental illness we have to deal with are huge. So HIV is two things. It's our immune system and then the virus. You want to put that virus under our toe and keep it down there. Okay. We don't want to not take our pills and let it slip up and twist around and get resistant. And then, but then there's our immune system. So our bodies try and rebuild it. We can help that. We can all help that by being conscious of exactly how we treat that body to give it as much power as possible. Is that, that, no, that's good. that gives me ideas about how to encourage people. Right. I mean, it really is very, very important that we look after that immune system. Because right? as you get older, that immune system gets weaker and weaker. Darren. Uh, I think we have time for one more question after this. Does anyone in the house have one? My question is probably a very, very, very small population in the big picture of BC and North Canada. It is that we also must remember that there were babies born with HIV who have lived now into their 20s. Who are having babies of their own. Exactly. And I think, okay, that population we just don't get to see very often or hear about. And I'm just curious, what is sort of... I don't want to use the word success, but what's that success look like? For there's a very small minority population that we really don't have a picture in the general public view. Okay. So, um, 
you know, my experience is not pediatric, but I do have an in, a researcher, who is my daughter, who does that. So there's not a huge population, as you say, that here. Um, but those individuals are amazing. You can't tell the difference, right? They're not kind of decrepit, sick people. They're young teenagers, they're young people, they're having families. Um, they, you know, they are being heavily researched because of the medications they've been on for all of those years, and obviously they, some of those medications do have effects. Um, um, and, you know, those folks have been fairly treatment experienced with various, so I can't say they're just totally normal, but they're not dying off early, they're not getting sick for things. Um, they may have vulnerabilities in their bone and that sort of stuff, but um, that's an ongoing piece of work right now. Just on the, the outside of things, we're doing very, very well. At the same time, just out of interest for you, examining newborns, uninfected newborns, and looking, trying to tease out the effect of the medications that their moms were taking and were received um, you know, until they got their negative diagnosis and the effect on, on them. And and um, there was a latest report that actually there is there is effects. There are effects. Sometimes those kids, if you look at them in Africa, there's a really good study just um, uh, a couple a couple of months ago. Those unaffected kids in that window period, about um, six months to eighteen months, actually um, are more prone to dying, okay? even though they don't have HIV because they have, it's just exposure to the environment of HIV in utero or maybe to the meds has affected their immune systems during that time. So, um, yeah, there, there are differences, clearly. Um, uh, in a big population like Africa, it kind of shows up. Here, the kids are doing, the young people are really doing very nicely. But, I mean, that's a population, I don't know what's positively doing with those folks. We may have the same issues around stigma as everyone else, right? Um, so, something to think about, you know? So, we only need young people in our organization. I think we have one more, uh, one more time for one more question, if anyone has one. This will be the final question, and then I'd like to invite John Bishop up after this. Thank you. I was thinking about all the years that we have been taking meds. Is there any type of uh, side effects at long term that we're to expect once, let's say, a person like me reaches 70, 80 years old? It, I'm sure there's all different medications, but is there some kind of study done already? There's loads of studies happening. There's loads of them. Um, and I think just the, the one that is sort of most widely looked at is the effect of particular ARVs on bone, right? Um, so people who've been on certain ARVs may be more vulnerable to osteoporosis or thinning of the bone, okay? Um, but it, the effect, it's hard to uh, um, look at the actual um, uh, magnitude of the effect because if we've been sitting around and smoking most of our time, you're going to have thin bones anyway, right? And if you've been doing that since you were young, when you were supposed to be building bone by, you know, throwing hay and, and you know, lifting weights and going to CrossFit and stuff, you haven't actually built bone. So you don't have a whole lot to lose. I'm losing bone, right? But I've carried a backpack for many years, so my spine is really full of calcium. It's really good because I've had that kind of weight-bearing kind of experience. So. It's not as simple as if I take this pill, it's going to do me in, in terms of my skeleton. It is, what did I, what did I do to build it up? You know, how have I looked after it? You know, um, I'm getting older, I'm going to lose it anyway. How can I kind of keep what I've got? Um, taking calcium isn't going to do it. And that's, taking pills is not the answer, um, because I just excrete it out. I just poop it out. I actually have to put it into my bones by lifting some weights. So. That's the kind of practical answer. Yes, all of our medications have some effects. 
but not doing things while we're taking those medications makes it that much more um, well, it's more, um, likely that we'll see a problem. So that's the good news. Okay, well, I, I'd like to thank all of you. I'm, I'm so um, privileged that um, I work in um, a town that has, and a province that has um, positive living in its midst, and all the wonderful work you do. Um, you are so, so helpful to so many people. You do great work. You have wonderful um, information for people. You're so positive. I love your new name. <laughs> 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 so please applaud yourselves. <laughs>